Hello, Frank Lloyd Wright fans, and welcome to presentation number four, Renting Frank Lloyd Wright, What It's Like to Live in Organic Architecture. And uh, this is the fourth part of my four-part series on these rentals that my wife and I had the privilege of staying two nights and three days in. I'm Colin Slace. I'm an architect in the Phoenix, Arizona area, and um, I'm your tour guide. And uh, let's get started. Today's house we're going to visit is the Seth Peterson Cottage in Mira Lake, Wisconsin. And again, as in uh, as with my other presentations, I don't like to go too much into too much of the history and dates and details so much as just some general information. And then we'll get right to touring the house, sort of starting around the outside and then working our way through the interior of the house. In this particular case, the client was Mr. Seth Peterson and his fiance. Uh, it's a one story little cottage again of only 880 square feet of living space. Of course, there's a lot more uh, outdoor covered terrace space, typical of Mr. Wright. It was completed in 1959, the year that Mr. Wright died. Um, Franklin Wright did die before the completion of this cottage. Um, unfortunately, this one has kind of a tragic history to it. Uh, Seth Peterson died at the age of 24 in a car accident before the cottage was completed. So um, that's a real shame. Fortunately, we all get to enjoy it. Um, and it is absolutely spectacular. And I highly recommend uh, staying um, at this cottage. You will enjoy it. Again, as I say with all of my presentations on these houses, Mr. Wright is trying to build thoroughbreds. So he's trying to keep the materials at a minimum. In this case, sandstone walls, flagstone floors, concrete, glass, and wood. It's available for rent at www.sethpeterson.org. Uh, book early. I think we booked a year in advance. Um, and because of COVID, I don't know what you know, the restrictions are and where they are with rentals now. Um, we were there a number of years ago, but I highly recommend booking very early. In fact, when I spoke to the person who I booked it with over the phone, he said, I wish we had a lot of Seth Peterson cottages because it was the most popular rental. Um, William Wesley Peters, Franklin Wright's apprentice and son-in-law was quoted as saying of this cottage that there was more architecture per square foot than any other building he knew. And I can vouch for that. Again, we always start with the site as Mr. Wright does. And uh, little cottage is down here and all of this broccoli and a beautiful river here. Um, and we were there in November again, which is the best time. One of the best times I think to go because again, the leaves are off the trees. You can see farther and you can get around the house and see the house better for photographs. So it's a great time of the year to go. Fireplace is necessary. I think it got down into the 20s when we were there. As, as a matter of fact, I think that river um, actually froze um, the night we were there. So that was really cool. Um, starting at the gates off the main road, um, Mr. Wright always started the architecture out here at the end of the drive. In this particular case, I don't think these piers, these stone piers and gates were designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. But um, after when the cottage was built and it had went through major repairs and renovation, um, these gates were built uh, to mark the entrance to the property and uh, to kind of just mark for people the location um, of the cottage because it is hard to find. This is all just literally woods um, around it. but. Um, Whoever did design it knew what they were doing because it's organic. And you'll notice later here, the design of these gates will follow through with the design of the house. And also the same stone was used as uh, at the cottage. And by the way, we got there late at night. I think it was like 10 o'clock at night. And we drove down this this road winds through the woods and makes snakes and turns until you get to the cottage. So it really is kind of a, you get kind of this Blair Witch kind of feeling 
Um, but we had to stop the car here to open the gate. And I got to look up at the stars in the sky and it was just absolutely fantastic. So um, again, floor plan of the house, which I always enjoy drawing. You can see here uh, the main entrance here. And you can also see that as Wright always does, the exterior material flows right into the interior. Um, so in this case, it's flagstone instead of the Cherokee red concrete. Um, but that material flows uh, right inside. We have our core here, fireplace, always in the middle, always the heart of the home. Everything kind of pinwheels around it. Um, and then we have uh, the utility core, a little workspace or a little kitchenette in this case. Um, and then the bathroom uh, back here. So this is all this, this stone core. Um, and then we have a solid stone wall, uh, kind of a retaining wall um, back here. The view is out the windows here. Um, and a uh, little bedroom uh, back here with higher windows for privacy, a small window here in the bathroom. Um, and then the outdoor terrace here and the view to the river um, is basically kind of out this way. These are some um, kind of storage sheds. Uh, the firewood was housed in here. And again, not part of Wright's original design, but there was a lot of care taken into the design of these because again, they mimic the pitch of the roof, the, the sloped roof, the fascia detail. Um, and so they look uh, cohesive with the overall design. And here's the cottage. Front door is actually right here. Here's that masonry sort of bathroom, kitchen, fireplace core. The stone uh, wall here. Again, the house rises out of the site uh, to a, it's a wants to appear to be kind of stone outcropping. And then you have a pitched roof here and all this glass looking out to the view uh, and that little bedroom. Um, area here, smaller windows just for more privacy. Coming around the side now, the site kind of slopes down here. Again, care was taken into the, even into the design of this birdhouse because it has a single pitched roof, just like the house does. So we have again, organic architecture, part is to whole, as whole is to part, everything relates. And we saw some wonderful blue jays here in the morning. Uh, it was just fantastic. Continuing to kind of rotate around the house. Again, here's this great stone base, um, even kind of a battened uh, slope to the stone here. And it looks like it, it, it just is, a, it looks like a natural outcropping just coming out of the earth. As Mr. Wright used to say, out of the ground and into the light. There's also the typical perforated plywood panel geometric design motif, and that was mimicked in the metal gates at the front of the driveway. So again, you have that continuity. Continuing still to rotate around the house. Here's this outdoor terrace area. The roof cantilevers out to cover that. No columns there, always a cantilever, always large overhangs to protect the house from rain and snow, to provide shade from the sun. So it's always passive solar design, large overhangs. The sun is lower in the fall and the winter, lets the sunlight come in. In the summer, when the sun angle is higher, the roof casts a shadow over the glass. Then it requires less air conditioning, less heating. Again, this great stone base. Again, this little 880 square foot cottage. You know, these are the things Mr. Wright does. This is what, this is why Wesley Peters made that comment of more architecture per square foot. Because you, you look at this and it looks much larger than it is. Coming around the side now, here's that we call a mono pitch roof or a shed roof, single pitch, pitched up 
so that there can be more taller ceiling in the living dining area, in the main space, more glass, more exposure to the view. Coming around the back side now, this is the back of the living room where the built-in bench is, and then this is the bedroom. Fireplace core in the middle here, and then here's that kitchen utility core. And then coming around full circle now, the bedroom area, this large thin vertical window, sort of expressing the height, the verticality of this central masonry core. And then there's a stone path here with lights to the front doors. Follows the pitch of the roof. You do not have to have 90 degree angle square doors, it's custom. And Mr. Wright would probably say, why not? You can have an angle to the door. They worked just fine. And when you come in, this is what you see. So the little breakfast area, actually dining area here, living back behind here, fireplace behind this masonry mass or core, workspace just to the right, this uh, sort of partial height wall of the stone continues from the outside, inside, and then continues on outside through this rear terrace, the perforated plywood panels, Mimicking the steel gates at the front, always having a geometric motif for every house. Here's that workspace area. Here's the utility closet that houses the water heater, the furnace, storage, uh, utilities, mops, brooms, things like that. Again, very small. This is just a cottage. Um, you know, this might have been for weekend stays, summer stays. Um, so it was very compact, but very functional. All the necessities were there. Furniture, custom design by Frank Lloyd Wright, all out of plywood. Same thing with the cabinets. But again, there's that continuity. It's inexpensive. It's easy to handle and to build. Sort of standing in that breakfast area with the back of the front doors, following the slope of the roof refrigerator here, small sink. And again, whoever designed this hat and coat rack understood organic design or organic architecture that you have that same geometric motif here as well in the design of this coat rack. Again, all the parts relate. Looking into the living area now, Here's that stone wall in the back with the built-in bench, dining area, the breakfast with the dining match, the detail of the chairs. Everything's consistent, unified. Even the plywood ceiling, which extends right to the outside at the covered terrace and at the undersides of the roof eaves. Mr. Wright always built in these benches, usually there's storage. If you, if you remove the seat cushion, these plywood seats fold up, they hinge up, they double as storage. When you sit there, it really feels almost kind of cave-like, but in this, in this sense of security and, and comfort and peace and shelter, um, again, it, it, just, it just really, makes you more aware of your primitive human genes, we'll call them. Uh, really, again, sort of brings your bio, your natural bio rhythms back to a connection to nature. In this dining area now, looking back at the entrance, breakfast area, again, always these massive stone fireplaces with the cantilevered uh, chimney, piece of steel under here that cantilevers out the stone, the stone sits on. These little pieces of stone protrudes that protrude out. Again, just like a natural rock outcropping, gives it some three-dimensionality, some depth, some detail, some texture. 
looks natural. Same light fixtures inside as out. Mr. Wright always doing the butt glazed corner windows, breaking the corner, breaking the box, allowing the space to flow out. What's inside goes out and what's outside comes in. Here's that low wall that extends right out to the outdoor terrace. And now out on the terrace, here's that river that froze that night. Again, you're up in the trees, part of the landscape. You just feel connected to it. Also from the terrace, that sloping roof, plywood ceiling extends out. Again, this feeling of, of shelter, of covering, of protection from the elements and, and nature, a part of it, always a part of your view. Coming back in through those rear doors now, front doors here with the stone path, flagstone floors inside and out, perforated plywood geometric pattern, the plywood ceiling extending to the exterior, the stone on the interior, same as on the exterior. Now, I always sneak these in because this was the decor of the day, 1950s. And so you can see you know, sort of these typical 1950s details and sort of this new common design ideas of the time. Now, at, at least it is, it is modern, it's contemporary. There's no ornamentation much to speak of. It is clean, it's simplified, but again, stylized. And when you compare, again, what Mr. Wright was doing where everything is integrated and of each other, a little bit different than what was done at the time. Mr. Wright was never into fads, never into just the trend. He might have been trying to understand which way the country was going, where things were headed, you know, flat roofs, you know, the contemporary architecture, the international style, you know, what influence was that having? Why was it popular? Mr. Wright was never was going to copy. He was going to invent and innovate, but he was always aware of what was happening of the day. Continuing now, again, you always have this geometric pattern. Every house was different, every house was unique. Dining table here, all the glass looking out onto nature directly. As in the previous houses we've looked at and toured, you always have this built-in seat behind you, solid wall behind you, and your vista, your view, your prospect, always in front of you. The stage, always in front of you. The scenery, the view. Now sitting on that built-in bench, kind of looking to the left into the bedroom area, some built-in closets here separating the two. Always piano hinge, top to bottom, provided stability, strength, continuity of design and pattern, rigidity, uh, durability, this massive stone fireplace for such a small cottage. Mr. Wright always making the statement of a hearth was the center of the home. And we had wonderful fires in here. We, we had pizza, we sat here, we had wine. Uh, just, it was just absolutely wonderful. Again, sitting on the other side of the bench, built-in bench here, the sunlight coming in, shadows coming in. In the winter, we want that. We want that sun to come in, heat up the floor, and then at night, that heat radiates up into the space. Again, passive solar, passive heating. And now, looking into the bed area, still the plywood ceiling flat now. Smaller windows for privacy. When you're sleeping, you're unseen. This is a built-in armoire or storage area here. Plywood cabinets again, same throughout the house. 
same lighting inside as out. Again, you're surrounded by the stone, feeling of permanence, a feeling of security, feeling of shelter, protection. And then from that bedroom area, you have access right to the bathroom. This shower worked great. The flagstone floor sloped to a drain. We had a stainless steel uh, shower uh, material here. Close the curtain. Worked beautifully. You even have a, a bench here, again, following the design of the house, the geometric motif, plywood ceiling, same lighting, always continuity. You know, I hear people say today, sometimes you, you hear the term matchy matchy. Well, uh, Mr. Wright was just all about, I don't think he would call it that, you know, it was all about continuity. It was all about this sort of holistic approach to the design, that everything relates to something else. Now in the bathroom, looking back out to the bedroom, here's that built-in storage closet again, had hangers and uh, coat uh, hangers and a rod in there. It's great for you know staying for a few nights, overnight stays, worked perfectly. Again, pare down, simplify, no clutter, Again, even this, you know, again, the stone, that stone is going to continue throughout the entire house. That plywood paneling, plywood doors, plywood furniture, plywood ceilings, that's going to continue throughout the entire house so that there's this sense of cohesiveness. You know, just as in nature, you know, you take a tree, take even the woods in general, take any animal, there's just, there's, there's this integral holistic design Nothing's out of place. Nothing's sort of um, creates uh, something that the eye doesn't appreciate or understand or, or um, find beauty in. 1959 was when the house was built. And I think they had, when it was during original construction, they had stuck, uh, the builders had stuck a penny in the concrete, in the flagstone floors. And when they renovated, they did it again in 1999. So I thought that was really cool to uh, kind of connect to that history. So remember, back out to the gates, remember what we talked about at the very beginning, the design of these gates. You don't just do any kind of gates. They're custom and the design, again, always relates. That's organic architecture back inside the house, that same pattern. We bring that in, we connect the two, we tie everything together, and then look what happens. The shadows, now the shadows even bring about that geometric motif. So again, in summary, Mr. Wright understood or sort of wanted to express that the main purpose of architecture was a sense of shelter. Again, hence the large overhangs, the stone, the solid walls behind you with the windows in front of you, the built-in benches, um, the sense of permanence, of comfort, of peace, um, always a love and respect for nature, of course, which is the ultimate context within which all buildings exist. Street names, I always mention street names. I've done it before in the previous um, houses that we've stayed in. Um, I always like to point out that as I've been traveling Frank Lloyd Wright sites since the 1990s, I've been in probably over a hundred Frank Lloyd Wright houses and buildings. I began to notice that a lot of the houses were on streets that had a nature component to their name like Frogtown Road, Rock Brook Drive, Tall Oaks, West Palo Verde Drive, Wisteria Way, Great Oak Circle, uh, Woodland Avenue, West Lake Road. I mean, just amazing that the world's greatest architect known for his love of nature ends up having these, a lot of these houses he designed on streets with nature names in them. So how appropriate.
Um, again, right, returns you to your natural biorhythms. That was in my conversation with Donna Penfield from the Penfield House. Um, that that's what she felt his architecture returned you to were these natural biorhythms. Unlike today, of course, where we're all busy, we're all frantic, it's all chaotic. We're all pulled in all kinds of different directions. I don't even think most of us know what our natural biorhythm is anymore. Um, and you won't until you get back into nature, get to these houses, turn the phones off, relax, be quiet, meditate, open the windows, listen to the leaves rustle, listen to the rain hit the roof, listen to the birds, feel the breeze. Mr. Wright actually said, I never wanted to be separated from the elements, I wanted to be part of them. Now, that doesn't mean that he wanted to be rained on. It just meant that he wanted to be aware of when it was raining, when it was snowing, where the sun was, what time of the year it was, that connection to nature that we're all pretty much lacking today. These houses and Mr. Wright's, Mr. Wright's architecture in general were supremely human. This is a humane architecture. Uh, what does that mean or why? Again, going back to the primitive roots of humanity, if you wanna call it going back to the caveman days, just this need for security, this need for protection, this never ending human characteristic and need for shelter, uh, for comfort, for peace, for joy. Uh, this is what Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture gives you. And this is what you will experience in Frank Lloyd Wright buildings. Uh, as Mr. Wright used to say, he believed that a building should be a grace to its site rather than a disgrace. Um, that it should be one with the site. That it should, as Mr. Wright said, a building should look like it belongs where you see it standing. Now this Seth Peterson cottage is one of the best examples of that. That couldn't be on a city street on a flat lot anywhere. It needs the slope of the site. It needs the woods. It's relating to nature and to that location. The view of the river, the view of the woods. It's site specific. These houses and buildings that Mr. Wright designed, they are alternate universes. Um, they are environments of possibility, beauty, privacy, peace, space, and comfort. Um, they are joys to be in. They're unforgettable. Um, they are life-changing. And uh, I just can't recommend enough to visit these houses and uh, when you can stay a couple of nights in a Franklin Wright house, take it. It is worth it. These are also complete works of art. As we said before, part is to whole as whole is to part. That's where the integrity lies. That it's a unified, cohesive whole. Everything relates. The parts relate. And so you end up with a unified whole, not a conglomeration of a variety of different materials and products from all over. There is no eclectic eclecticism in Wright's design. It's organic, meaning everything relates. And in that, there's this sense of relaxation, of unity, um, of rest. Um, the, the, the eye, there's nothing disparate that catches the eye in some kind of irritating or uncomfortable way. Um, and these houses obviously are a part of the landscape and of the environment, a complete connection to them. And isn't it interesting how that is definitely the way the world is headed today with sustainability, with green building, green ideas, green architecture, um, environmental design. I mean, Mr. Wright was 60, 70, 80 years ahead of his time. Um, Mr. Wright's architecture also was a representation of a free democracy, of the freedom of the individual, and obviously unconstrained by any styles. This is not classical architecture, it's not Georgian, it's not colonial, 
Um, it simply is what it is based on the client's needs, the budget, the materials, the site, and the relationship between all of those. The guest books of these houses are a joy to read. Um, they're full of praise and appreciation, and they are a testament to the genius of Frank Lloyd Wright, to organic architecture, to the importance of it, to, I mean, I mean people expressed this spirituality, the feeling of spirituality, this almost religious temple-like experience. Again, very meditative, um, life-changing, um, connecting with nature and to yourself in a way that maybe you never have before. Um, what's wonderful about these houses is their, is their silence. And in that, you can enjoy the view, enjoy nature. You can live in the moment. Um, it, it's just, it's just, it's miraculous. It really is. The simplicity, it's another thing. Uh, that is, simplicity is um, something I think completely necessary today. I think if more of us lived a more simplified life, um, we'd be a lot better off. There's something very liberating about just having what you need and needing what you have. Um, decluttering, which Wright's architecture requires you to do and asks of you. And speaking of that, I always end with a speech from Ralph Walker to Frank Lloyd Wright for Frank Lloyd Wright's acceptance of the gold medal award, which is the highest award given by the American Institute of Architects. And in that speech, Ralph Walker says of Frank Lloyd Wright and to Mr. Wright, you design your buildings as if they were to take their place in a happier world, one of light, of grace, of gaiety, and for human beings who are not burdened with fear, for humans who live in a world where what seems possible is actually so, and where the pioneer concept of democracy seems a reality. All your life, you have denied the minimum and have reached for the stars. A free man and a free land, you have asked a drab society to compromise with you on the basis of your ideals. And with that, that ends today's talk on the Seth Peterson Cottage. And of course, there is the world's greatest architect of all time. I've heard him described as America's greatest architect. I've heard him described as one of the greatest architects. And I've heard him described as the greatest architect of the 20th century. And I would say all of those are true, but that he was the greatest architect of all time. Next presentation is going to be on our own house, uh, a remodel that we did, Frank Lloyd Wright inspired, where we built the furniture, all the decor, all the products, and um, I'm very excited about showing that to you next time. And until then, I say goodbye and look forward to seeing you again very soon.